We're going to keep things moving this morning with our first panel discussion. This panel will explore the natural connection between user experience and agile development. We have a talented group of speakers to kick this panel off. Uh, so please join me in welcoming to the stage Caroline Smith, Natalie Kurtz, and Larry Buffundo. Hello. All right. Great. Great start. Okay. Um, this is a panel on Agile and UX. You want to try this one? Is this better? No. How about that one? Uh, we can share. Do yours work? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. This is a panel on Agile and UX. <laughs> This is not awkward at all. <laughs> um, my name is Larry. I'm the director of product at Ad Hoc. Uh, before that, I was with uh, 18F and Code for America. And then I'll let our two panelists introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Caroline Smith. I'm a design strategist with USDS, and currently detailed to Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. I'm Natalie Kurz. I'm the director of UX for Flexion, uh, formerly an innovation fellow at CFPB. trying to create some more space for there ourselves. Okay, uh, so the beginning of this day has been pretty interesting in terms of talking big picture. It was really interesting to see Anne and Greg fight for the last word on Agile, and, <laughs> but I guess you will get the last word because that's exactly what we're gonna be getting into here. So let's start off with like level setting for the audience. Um, what do we mean by the concepts or the terms Agile and UX? You wanna take the UX one? So I actually feel like Greg um, set us up really well for this talk um, because something that is very important to note is that um, Agile, it didn't matter in the project that he was talking about whether they had started with Agile versus Waterfall because if they had just taken those requirements, um, they would have gone in the wrong direction mm -hmm. with either process. And what he looped it back to and needed to tie it back to was what do the users need? And that's the point that you always need to start from before you can start to execute the process. Um, so for me, UX, human-centered design, whatever you might want to call it, whatever umbrella your flavor of design might fall under, is always making sure that you understand what the user's you are designing for what their pain points are, what their needs are, um, and tying that back with what the business needs are as well mm -hmm. to be your North Star. Right. And then when we talk about Agile, we talk um, a lot about kind of repetitive processes and incremental delivery. And really what, what Agile, I think in its purest form, is, is about its options, right? So it's, it's deferring decisions to the latest point possible because you don't want to make a decision six months prior. You want, you want to use the, the information you have today, right, from your research, from your users. Use the information you have today to make your decisions moving forward. And that, those decisions may change during the next sprint or the next month. And if you're constantly building to what you had six months ago, right, that's the notion of like these set requirements, you're, you're going to miss the mark, right? So the whole notion of Agile is being able to flex and move. Um, and the way that you do that is kind of deferring those decisions to as late as possible so that you can work with the information you have at hand. So uh, would you say it's more process or mindset? I, I think it's a mindset. I think that there are a lot of um, organizations think that they're running an agile kind of development process because they're doing agile ceremonies, right? So they're doing a stand up or they're doing a sprint review or a retro and they're like, yay, we're agile. But that's actually not quite, like that's part of it. That's part of how you can achieve that um, agile delivery. But what's more important is, is, is this kind of mindset of being flexible and, and being open and kind of constantly shifting and changing to the user needs based on your user research and um, going from there. Yeah, and when I think of mindset, I, I, it's culture. It mm -hmm. ties yeah. closely to culture, yes. right? So you have to have leadership that's aligned with we will 
we will test, we'll iterate, we'll fail, we'll learn. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to prioritize learning. Um, and it's okay to change tack based on what we might learn. Um, and, what, and whatever process needs to be in place to enable the ability to learn and change and tack based on what you, what you gather. We can call it purple for all I care, right? right. right? It is the, it's this mindset mm -hmm. of being willing to um, say you don't know, go out there, identify what the needs are, and, and, and proceed from there. Yeah. Yeah. Mine works now? Great. <laughs> um, great, cool. So can you be user-centered while not being agile? While not being agile? Oh, yes, because, I mean, there, there are a lot of, I think, projects that start with this kind of user research piece up front. Like, we're going to bring you in for three months, we're going to find out what the users need, and then you're going to go away and we're going to build the thing that you told us to build. That's not agile, right? That's, that's we're going to do, you know, that, that is using uh, human-centered design, right? We're getting the user's needs, but we're getting them so far up front, and we're not testing along the way. We're not seeing if the things that we're building are actually meeting their needs until the end. So that's, that's very much that waterfall kind of concept of, you know, we've got this design over here, we're going to throw it over the wall to our developers, you have fun, we're going to go do it onto our next project. So I think the key um, to this marriage between Agile and UX is having a cross-functional team throughout the entire life cycle of your project. You need engineers in discovery, you need UXers in development, you need those people working together day in and day out to create the best product for your users, um, and that needs to go from day one. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, it's, you can also, I, I think a lot of the uh, people that I work with, clients from the private sector or people within government, um, truly believe they are um, human-centered or user-centered. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's also it comes down to a question of who their users are. A lot of the time it might be um, other political stakeholders or your, your co-workers um, or your bosses. And so um, it, it is easy in their mind that they are user-centered, or and if they're going through these um, um, stand-ups to mm -hmm. think that they are agile, but it, it goes back to um, what what are we trying to achieve? Um, and if we're trying to learn or if we're trying to test, then then there are different... Yeah, it, it, it's not about the execution of the, the process, um, necessarily it's about the it, let's just answer this question mm -hmm. great so we've talked a bit about um what these practices are like in theory right and and why they're important what are some symptoms or hallmarks of of situations where you're you think you're doing agile or you think you're doing uh good ux but you're really not mm, that's a good question I think, um, again, as we talked about, right, going through the ceremonies, going through the, that process and saying, like, we're agile, like, that, that's, again, it has to come from that mindset of, of truly iterating and, and changing based on the new information that you have. So just because you're doing retros and stand-up doesn't mean that you're truly delivering an agile product. And I think with, with in terms of user experience, focusing on the user, it's, you're not just talking to your users once. It's not just, like, an upfront thing where we, like, we talk to them, we get some, we get some information, and then we don't talk to them again until the end. You're not, you know, so I think those are some symptoms. If you're not talking to users on a regular basis, if you're not sure who your users are, right? And again, your users could be a wide variety of people. You may have different users that have different needs, um, especially in these complex government systems. You're probably going to have some internal users. You may have, like, consumers that are going to be using these products. So you need to keep in mind, like, all of your users. Um, and I think even when you get down into kind of the weeds of things in terms of Agile, um, one thing that we've had great success with is um, when you're writing your user stories, when you're figuring out like what is the thing that I'm going to do, if you, str like I think one of the symptoms of, of that you're not doing good UX is if you put design elements into those user stories, right? So if, you, if, if the story is like a user's gonna be able to click on a button and do this thing, it's like, well, maybe they don't need to click on the button. Maybe that's something else, right? So that, that notion of leaving emergent design open so that the designers and the developers can figure out what's the best way to solve this problem. So writing those stories in a way that you're just talking about those user requirements what does the user need to do? What's the problem that they need to solve? And then letting the team kind of figure out that solution. I think that's another symptom of, of kind of not doing good UX or, or not doing uh, Agile properly. And I love that you're already, that you're mentioning um, 
agile artifacts in, mm -hmm. in, in this conversation right now, like user stories, for right. example, um, because that's where I love to pull from agile being a, a design researcher, like that's my T, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's my core. And so um, I got interested in agile when I was learning about user stories. It's just really good kind of frameworks mm -hmm. for people to get their thoughts and ideas out, even, even to the point of, um, okay, you have this on paper, Ah, now I see that you want your writing in there. Users will be able to click on this button. That's not a user story. So right. even being able to use that as a tool to walk them back and say, mm -hmm. okay, let's get back to the but why, but why, but why. Oh, you right. need them to check out. Right. Okay. Um, and I also love pulling from Agile in terms of the, the other thing that I love about this methodology is um, just uh, prioritization. Yes. So again, Natalie was mentioning you might have a lot of different users um, and a lot of different industries, uh, consumers, what state, internal stakeholders. So um, how do you prioritize who you go after um, and who you focus on in this first quarter, maybe this next quarter? Mm -hmm. And I think Agile is another great way to help people focus and prioritize that. And we can see, um, you know, I've been on projects where I've seen people throw user research at a lot of things, but they're not priori prioritizing. So I would say that's also an example yeah. of bad, um, but with still the methodologies being mm -hmm. executed. Right, no, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, how might, uh, Caroline, maybe we can start with you on this one. Uh, how might your approach to marrying these two practices change depending on where you are in the life cycle of a project or a product? Um, so, we all had a call before this, this <laughs> uh, uh, presentation to just uh, I, I ideate on what we could talk about. And Natalie and I both zoomed in on this really quickly because um, there are different research methodologies, different types of user research that can, you can do depending on the maturity of where you are in your project or product or service. I, I don't care what it is, right? So in the very and, – and when I – here people talk about agile it's a lot about um let's test and iterate on this and it's sometimes it's small incremental iterations let's do a b testing whatever a, the, a lot of the tests that i usually hear identified with agile are more of these we have a product already and we just want to improve upon it um but if you don't have a product or service yet um, how do you still want to use agile if you don't know what you're going off to build mm -hmm. right um and so what we do at the U.S. Digital Service and what I try and push on my clients before in the private sector is um, if you are in this very exploratory phase, you need to carve out some time um, before maybe you get into the two-week sprints that might not fit for uh, an extended period of time where you're doing the user research where you need to understand who, who are we building for and what do they want. Um, you need to carve out time to what we call it is a discovery sprint, to just understand uh, who, who's in this space, what do they need, um, and, and try and start to identify like little indicators of what might be worth going after. That, that for us, it, we try and get that into four-week sprints, and sometimes it goes over because sometimes we can't get our hands on the right people to interview. That doesn't fit in a two-week agile sprint, right? But that is that should be what sets you up to then hit it away with the bat once you've identified, like, this is actually what we want to go off and test mm -hmm. from what we've uncovered in our user research as an indicator of something that might be worthwhile to go after. Right, like, are we building the right thing? Exactly. Um, so, so I think, depending, in, in this example, I'm talking about very early stage, exploratory, you don't have a product or service yet, this discovery research is important, and then once you identify some indicators in your research about, mm, let's maybe try and go off and prototype this and prototype this concept even. Not even we're not even at a product yet. We're not even at a clickable prototype yet. Like some, sometimes it can be, let's test mm -hmm. this concept. Then you can start to move it into that maybe two week sprint um, process. But that's, that's what I, I mostly work in the very beginning stages of ideas and projects. And so that's that's what I um, that's what I do in my work. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to add to that is I think it is also important to kind of involve engineers in that process too, right? There's there's engineering, there's development discovery that happens as well. So it's not just something that like UXers or designers or researchers are going to go off and do. There's a lot of kind of legwork that needs to happen um, from the engineering side, from the build side at those early stages. And I think that's something that a lot of folks miss 
um, when kind of scoping projects or thinking about projects. It's like, okay, we're going to have designers for two months, and then we're going to bring in our engineers. Yeah. Like, you need to start together. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk yeah. about the different perspectives on a team. And so you mentioned already the importance of having a cross-functional approach yes. when it comes to building products for people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my experience, too, like, people see things from different angles, right? Engineers are, are, or more technical folks are, have a bias towards one way of thinking, perhaps, than, like, a design researcher. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you practically bring together those different perspectives to, to build the right thing? Sure, um, we're we're kind of we have a project right now. We're about a year into it, um, and we've been very very successful at kind of executing agile UX. And what we what I mean by that is is we have designers and engineers paired up daily, right? We've got a, a team, a cross functional team that works side by side, and the designers are not designing one sprint out or two sprints out or one week out. They're designing hours, maybe a day ahead of the developers. And then the developers are getting in there. They're building the thing. They're showing it to the designers live in real time. They're tweaking things. They're talking about ideas. Um, and then we do daily kind of design, um, uh, kind of like a daily design call where we get on with the product owner. We talk on a, on a daily basis with our stakeholders to get their feedback on these designs so that we can move very, very quickly and we can execute very quickly. And the, the engineers are on those calls too and they can give feedback right there in real time of like, hey, there's an easier way, you know, that, that design looks great, but there's an easier way to implement it if we do it this way, right? And you can have those conversations in real time. And we've had tremendous success with this kind of a model and our designers are learning a ton about engineering. Our engineering engineers are learning a ton about design in kind of this, this cross-functional way. Um, and it's it's, uh, taken away, like in, in past um, jobs that I've had where I've been in the private sector, there's sometimes like this friction between design and development, and this has completely erased all of that. Everyone's speaking the same language, everyone's moving toward the same target, um, and it's been really great to witness. Cool. That's wonderful. Well, I mean, we at USDS, we also work closely um, uh, design, engineering, and product, and uh, it's, it's a joy to be able to work on such a cross-functional team. and. I know when to pull my engineers in when I hit something I don't understand that's technical because I'm not a technical person despite being on the US Digital Service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, there is, is work that we can go off and do as far as just understanding processes, right? Um, but then at some point when we as design might start to think, well, how can we change some of these processes, if, if I, for example, let me give a tangible example. I'm on a project at CMS right now where we're trying to modernize the Medicare payment system. The system's running on mainframes. It's 40 years old. There's a million lines of COBOL and assembler on that. We want to try and move this to the cloud. And so part of this is trying to understand how, how our claims currently process, so that current status mm -hmm. research, right? Um, but then when we start to think about, well, what could we move, what could we but like sequence out, what little part could we sequence out and try and test in the cloud before mm -hmm. moving forward? At that point, I I need to I need to scrub in my engineers who can who can give me some some overall context on what might be difficult or easy. And it's literally just writing up research questions and interview um, programs with my engineers. That's that's how we we do that at USDS. And I think, sorry, one more important thing I think to add is that the product owner is part of the team. So when we talk about a multidisciplinary team, the product owner is absolutely included in that team. Uh, and again, on this project that I mentioned earlier, our product owners in retros, there's extreme transparency, right? She sees all the sausage being made, right? All the problems that may be happening in the team, and she's right there and there with us, helping us solve those problems. And one of the big things that we've done is she's never acted as a product owner before, so we've done a lot of training with her so that she understands kind of what her role is and how to write user stories in a way that don't that doesn't define how they're going to be executed. And so I think that that piece of it is a really really important piece, especially when you're talking about government agencies and and they may not have done a project like this. They may have a product owner that's never done anything like this before. So I think having that kind of uh, mentorship within within the team is really important as well. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, sticking with that, yeah. what does a good product owner look like? Oh. You want to tackle that first? I can go first. All right, so I think it's someone who's very engaged, right? Somebody who understands the space, and I think it's also some, somebody who knows when they don't know. Because I think a lot of product owners think that they have to know everything, as opposed to like, I don't know that, I'm gonna go find out, right? And I think it's also someone who brings in the right stakeholders, other stakeholders from other groups at the right time. Um, and someone who also understands kind of the why, because that's, that's a big job 
um, that designers have in a project, especially when you're building some kind of system or you're modernizing a legacy system. It's like, why do you do it that way? Why is that really a need? Well, it's a need because the system you had was built that way, so that's why your process is this way. It doesn't have to be that way, right? So it's really kind of a product owner who doesn't mind being asked, like, I feel like a parrot, why, 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 right? So a product owner who, who can take that, right, and who can come back and, and give you good answers so you can get to the root of the problems um, for, for what you're trying to design. Yeah, and I, I can build off of that by also helping paint a picture of maybe what um, a bad product owner might be or kind of what we run into sometimes, um, both in the private and, and public sector, mm -hmm. of people who maybe um, were project managers yeah. all of their life. And so project managers, the, the difference between a project manager and a product owner um, is this is this ability to answer why mm -hmm. is the ability to strategically be able to know when to change tack yes right and so project managers might be very comfortable by um writing up plans and following them mm -hmm. right but what we need as product owners uh, is and in order to to be able to answer the why this person needs to have a foot in the operations but a p foot also in the um Kind of the, the user space. The yeah. user space too. So, so this person is going to be able to kind of walk around and know all of the opinions and desires of the stakeholders and kind of give air cover to the team mm -hmm. that's executing the work and give guidance to that team based on what this person is doing in all of the meetings with the stakeholders as well. So, yeah, you you have that person has to be able to um, be able to critically synthesize information mm -hmm. and from there give strategic direction and I see some failing sometimes in people who might not have um, been given the opportunity to do that critical analysis piece and and, and instead just set up and follow plans mm -hmm. um, so when you you need to push them to to think critically sometimes um that does require a, a bit of upskilling mm -hmm. um and also there's a culture piece too of like mm -hmm. it's okay if we fail or right to, and you know it's it's a a multi-pronged approach to, to kind of move people from um if you if you're doing this moving people from project management to product ownership mm -hmm. and and those are the pieces that you need to focus on change yeah i'm gonna add three things that i thought of while you were talking um so one is i think somebody who doesn't come in with a preconceived notion of what they want to be built i think that's a, a big problem that we see with someone who comes in and says yes this is what we're going to do and then anytime you present something that's that's contrary to that there's there's some friction there i think somebody who is um, empowered to make decisions mm -hmm. That is a critical piece. The product owner is the one that needs to be making decisions, not taking things back to some committee and, and translating between people, right? So, so I think that's, um, and then kind of building upon that, somebody who is um, kind of empowered to advocate for the project, someone who believes in the project, who can maybe help remove obstacles that may be coming down from um, executives or, or policymakers or whoever. So somebody who's kind of there to fight for the project. Cool. Um, so switching gears a little bit, yeah. uh, it's interesting to hear both of you talk about your past experiences in the private sector coming to government. And as agile human-centered practitioners, I'm curious, what surprised you about working with government um, compared to your experiences in the private sector? Um, what surprised me? I think what surprised me is that there's just as much red tape, right? Or, or maybe I was expecting more red tape in government. It's just different kinds of red tape that you have, right? So a lot of it may be budgetary, some of it may be policy or law um, based things that, that get in your way. Um, so that was a little bit of a surprise. Maybe that there wasn't as much red tape as I thought there would be. That's a good thing. Um, for me, it was learning the, the impact of good procurement. Um, mm -hmm. Because um, not all agencies are so um, uh, contract contractor heavy. Uh, but, but at CMS, we, we really are. Um, and so being able to procure the right teams and the right talent from the beginning sets you up for success versus if you're not able to procure the right team, you will only be good as the team that you procured, no matter how hard you try and do agile and human-centered design and whatever. And so that, um, you know, what Aaron was speaking about before, I can, it, really, it really does hit home that um, there is a big gap in the market 
uh, for this, and, and I think that's the largest impact and difference that I've seen. Uh, have you either had this experience or perhaps like just thoughts on how you would approach it, but how would you introduce and broaden the use of these practices, Agile, human centered design, UX, within an agency or office that is either resistant or very new to these concepts? Like, what's the strategy or playbook for building support for that way of working? I think one, one way is, is to start really small. See if there's something really small that you can do and show them in a month or two, show them the, the benefits of, of this kind of way of working and, and the fact that you can actually produce, you know, working code, working products um, in short periods of time. So I would say that would be one thing. And I think also just the, the coaching kind of mentoring piece Right, so, so helping train them, helping um, them understand why it is that you're wanting to do things the way that you're doing them as opposed to just trying to force your way into doing them. I think understanding the why um, for them is, is really important. Um, so I was actually, before I joined government, I was helping um, large legacy companies in the private sector like Vodafone and Merck uh, go through global digital transformations um, where they wanted to introduce Agile and wanted to introduce HCD, Human Centered Design. Um, and what strategy we took was um, find people who might already have the mindset or be interested. Mm -hmm. And already finding people who were interested and maybe even self-selected as wanting to participate in this was a huge deal, right? And you're not trying, we can't get everyone on board at once. We don't have the resources, we don't have the time. Um, but finding, kind of seeing who in the organization might already be interested. Um, and then cobbling together a little team from there um, and teaching, upskilling them and wherever they need to be upskilled and giving them a piece of work. That was, that was one strategy we did. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever attended um, a Scrum at Scale workshop or, or training. I did. You know, there, the recommendation and the strategy in there was to, if you had, like, top-level um, air cover, like you, like the CEO brought you in, for example, asking that leader, what is your worst performing group in the company? So no matter what we do, we can't go any further, right? And, and using that, going in and, and implementing Agile, that was one way that, that the trainer recommended because there's nothing to lose here. We can only gain. Um, and, and then if you are able to show significant um, efficiency or like a decrease in errors or cost or whatever, you know, that speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are two different strategies that I've heard um, work. I haven't had a chance to work on the, the latter strategy, but um, if, you, if you don't have anything that's dying within your company, but you do want to introduce it, and being able to find some advocates or cheerleaders or uh, friendly faces mm -hmm. and working with them and going from there um, is, is a good way. Uh, but how do you find those people? Um, so at Merck, what we did was work with senior leadership on each market that we wanted to um, help transform and then kind of ask them um, who they thought might be willing and open to participate. And sometimes you would get the leaders who wanted to just bring their favorite employees along but also we tried to choose leaders that were, were also had this mindset and, and would know their, work, their own workforce. Um, so that's, that's one way. Another way is just kind of doing a road show, like having a brown bag lunch on what is HCD, mm -hmm. what is Agile, people who come to that coming on their own time. They can come up afterward and be interested. So there's a lot of different ways to communicate this mm -hmm. um starting like yammer groups if the company used yammer you know so that that also helps find friendly potentially friendly faces in mm -hmm. large organizations or natalie how would you if you had to think of an innovator in government that would be the ideal person to work with to bring in these practices into an agency how would you describe them in like three adjectives oh and, and like Hmm. What type of person are they? What type of person are they? Yeah. Hmm. That's I'm a good question. question. Yeah, I was going to say, Sorry, targeted no, question. Um, I mean, I think somebody who is, uh, like, flexible in, in their way of thinking, right? I think somebody who is 
um, great communicator, and I think somebody who's kind of in tune with uh, what the, the core problems are in terms of, of um, you know, digital services within the government. What about empowered? I mean, I think empowered is definitely, I, I guess empowered, being empowered by yourself doesn't necessarily mean anything. I guess so. It's if if the agencies that they're going to empower them, right? That empowerment I think comes from the agencies. So I think that's a, an important thing for them to receive, but maybe not, um, maybe not a core trait of themselves. That shouldn't be too hard to find. Right? Yeah. No. No. Totally easy. <laughs> uh, so we got about ten minutes left, and uh, if there is any interesting questions from the audience, we can take them. Or even uninteresting questions. We'll answer those too. Is there a mic or should I walk over? Well, there's, oh, a, mic. there's a mic. Oh, sorry. Um, excuse me. So I am very new to this entire process. So what I would like to know is, can you tell me exactly what is UX? And if you can give us an example of a project that mirrors a true partnership of Agile and UX. Do you want to take the first part? I'll take the second part. OK. <laughs> what, you is, what is UX? Um, How much time you got? I'm sorry, so, is this the right panel for? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, totally the right panel. Okay. No, it's just Thank like, you. I don't know. We, we could talk for like six <laughs> hours about that, so trying to, trying to just distill it down. Um, so, let me just use an let me just use an example. So, um, if you live in Washington D.C. and you ever go to an area where you want to park and you have like three different signs telling you information about whether you can park there or not, I've always hated that from a UX point of view because I'm like, what does this mean? That's not UX. Um, well, it's a sign of bad. That's yes, a sign of like yes. no UX, like no user. So user UX stands for user experience. So let's start there. Okay. Yeah. Let's define our acronyms. Um, so basically. Good UX, you shouldn't even see it. You could definitely notice when there's no user experience taken into consideration, as, as Carolyn just said, right? Like gas station, um, like the, the digital things where you check out on gas stations, a great example of like really just bad user experience. So um, here, keep so, going. So let me build off of that example, because yeah. I really have been trying to think about how could I very quickly show an example of good, good like bad to good. Mm -hmm. um, so if we wanted to go out and change the parking sign uh, product. Um, sometimes our clients might tell us we would like an app. Um, <laughs> so let's say I get that, that, um, that proposal, that, that uh, directive in my project to change the terrible parking sign um, problem. So um, I, could, I could create an app that you could log into and it could tell you digitally what the signs say. That's still not very helpful. Maybe the perfect solution that would be truly user focused would be something that was able to locate where I was, um, like Google Maps, and it already has my information that I am a private driver. I'm not a truck driver, I'm a private driver. So based on the, the information, the personalized information that I put in from the beginning, I could open up this magical solution and it would tell me, Caroline, you are not allowed to park here from Monday to Friday at nine, from nine to, to five. That would be, we went from the physical information all the way to a personalized user-centric solution. Does that, I've, I've thought about this pro example, yeah. does that no. help people? No. So it's, 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 a, it's a matter of, of talking, <laughs> talking with users and understanding what is the pain point, what is the problem, right? In this example, it's I don't know where to park, right? So that's a problem we're trying to solve, help people understand where to park. The solution might be this personalized app. The solution might just be a better designed sign. It could be. Right? Could so be. That, that's the thing is that a lot of times um, clients will come to us and say, we want an app we to want solve a this digital problem. Solution. We want a digital solution. Yeah. And it may just be all you got to do is just make the sign more clear. Right? So that's, that's where UX comes into play is, is we talk to users, we understand what is the real problem, and then we work as a team to figure out what is the solution to this problem. And then there's another part of it, which is then we test the, continually test this thing with the users to go, are we meeting your needs? Are we meeting your needs? Does this thing work? Is there a better way to do this? Right, so we're continually improving the solution that we're, we're proposing as we go along um, to, to better meet those needs. So but before we get to the next question, yeah. uh, I feel like this is a really important point we have to nail yes. as a group here. Okay. I think we did. Okay. But like, how do you all feel about 
framing along these lines. You know, Agile is a iterative process for software development. UX is an input or lens into the Agile process. What do you mean by input or lens? Okay, so if we're building something in an Agile way, right? We're yes. building it in small pieces at a time, yes. incorporating feedback and adjusting as we go. The user experience is one aspect that informs our solution, right? There are also yes. technical considerations. Yes. There are budgetary considerations, time considerations. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at these things from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So if we see UX as a lens that we can apply to look at the solution differently, do we agree with that framing? I think so. Or is it problematic? No, I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't think that's problematic. I think. I think it's. Um, a set of a set of tools yeah. to okay. run experiments, right? It's a set of tools that you can use to help solve a problem and to help solve that problem in a way that actually solves the problem, yeah. right? And and because again, it, it also takes kind of your personal bias out of the equation because I think that's a lot of what UX is there to try to solve is like, well, I think this is the best way. It's like, well, that's great, but you're not the user, it's so the right? Yeah. It's cool. Uh, there was a question over there, over there somewhere. No, I was just gonna say that when when I'm in that situation with the parking site. I normally take out my iPhone and see if I have a lot of parts in it. Oh, it exists already. That's great. <laughs> there goes my million dollar idea. So, interesting. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the panel. It's been really enlightening. Uh, I had a different question, but uh, you just like piqued my interest uh, in the way that you were defining what user experience is uh, and talking about the lens. What is your stance and the fact that pretty much everyone is a designer, if you define the fact that design is about taking actions deliberately, and the fact that you need everyone in the organization to apply user experience mm -hmm. methodologies to the work that they do, from yeah. budgetary constraints, yeah. understanding that sometimes something needs to give, all the way to the engineers who need to understand how something should be coded in order to remove bias. Like all of that is user experience and I guess you have, you can put it two ways. Either you have agile as the umbrella and then user experience as the lens or user experience as the umbrella and then agile as the lens. So I would just love to get your thoughts on that convoluted question. Well, <laughs> technically I'm not on the panel. You can still, you can still answer the question. But, uh, I think that we're informed by user needs, but we don't solve exclusively for user needs. Like, whenever we're building a product, we also have to account for the time and space that we're operating in. So we might have a solution that's like, this is the ideal user experience, but it's like either technically infeasible or extremely costly to enable that experience. Like, what compromises or trade-offs do we need to make? Mm -hmm. And this is also like the product management brain mm -hmm. on the panel here now, like, you know, coming out. but. Uh, but I agree. I mean, I think that we all are designers because we deploy Agile because we're discovering the solution. We're not building against the plan or working two weeks down a fixed backlog in two-week increments. Um, so I think I would agree with that, your, your main statement, um, that, that we're all designers in that yeah, sense. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely think that's true. The, the notion of design thinking is something, I mean, a lot of UXers probably, mindset. yeah, it's a mindset, it's like a mindset. Ha have run workshops about getting folks on projects to think with more kind of that design thinking notion. And maybe there doesn't need to be a hierarchy. Maybe there isn't, it doesn't need to be one umbrella over another, right? I think there are just two things that, that kind of marry very well together to um, produce excellence. Yeah, I mean, people say Agile or Scrum is a mindset too. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a way of working, as is uh, user research. Right, um, or human-centered design. Or or, human, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, Favorite product to work on, ideally? Like my favorite project that I've worked on or like the thing that I want to work on? That you want to work on. Oh, goodness. Um, I don't know. I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. Or what do you want to fix? What do I want to fix? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right now, um, I have a big focus on healthcare. I mean, I think that there's just a lot, a lot, a lot wrong with uh, healthcare technology in general, right? So maybe global 
electronic medical records, that might be a place to start. Um, Something really easy like that, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, low impact. Right. Um, so uh, joining USDS is my first time in government, and I'm being exposed to a lot of things that I've never touched before. And I think what's really interesting to me that I've learned about is the process of, of policy creation. Um, and in some instances uh, where some of the people who are creating policy might not have done their own user research and testing. Um, and so for me, this is a new interesting um, space that I want to explore about human-centered design and, and the marriage between policy creation um, and where you can insert that. So that is where I would love to one day perhaps be able to scrub in and impact and, and work on and in. That'd be another great panel. We should regroup mm -hmm. on that. Can I change my answer? <laughs> I was going to say, actually thinking about it more, more specifically within government is making government more accessible to, to people, is, is making it more mobile friendly, uh, you know, more disability friendly, uh, and just making making it kind of um, there for everybody because I think that is a, a big problem we're facing right now. Agree, agree. Well, um, we're out of time. I want to thank you both uh, for your very thoughtful uh, contributions, and uh, I look forward to working with both of you at some capacity. Yes, thank you. Thank you.